Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts, chapter 13, and let's begin reading with verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they, for they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, Christ, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them, the prophets, in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, this will be Psalm 16, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto, unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. We'll stop there. Proverbs chapter 12 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. It's been said when someone lies to you, it's because they don't respect you enough to be honest, and they think that you are too stupid to know the difference. Every year around this time, it seems that we need to remind ourselves and those who are watching uh, on the internet of why we don't embrace the Easter mania as so many other Christian churches do. It's because there are several misinterpretations of the scripture concerning Christ's final week leading up to his resurrection and uh, the day Easter itself is rooted in the paganism of Isis and Ishtar and Ashtoreth and all of the pagan gods of the Old Testament. The Catholic Church has depended upon the scriptural ignorance of its members for centuries to keep propelling itself uh, over time and promoting things that are false concerning Christ last week. He did not die on Good Friday. He had to have died on the Wednesday just before. He said, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12, 40. Uh, nor had he ridden into Jerusalem then on Palm Sunday, but it would have been the Friday of the previous week. And he did not come out of the tomb at sunrise, just before the sunrise service and the pancake breakfast that normally follows. When they came to the tomb, before sunup, according to John 20, verse 1, they found it already empty. We believe that Christ rose on the first day of that next week after his crucifixion, but well before the disciples knew anything about it. There's a woman named uh, Pamela Meyer, and uh, she considered to be the foremost expert on deception in the United States, and she lectures or teaches banks and insurance companies and uh, lawyers how to detect fraud 
and how to tell when someone is lying to you. And she said, lying is a cooperative act. A lie has no power whatsoever by its mere utterance. Its power emerges when someone else agrees to believe it. And this is what's wrong with traditional Protestantism and most of modern Christianity. They're not interested in the truth, but rather traditions. Both Christians and non-Christians, believers and non-believers, have to admit that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of everything Christians believe. And it's at the heart of what we profess um, to trust in by Jesus Christ. Bible Christianity is the only ancient religion, I suppose if it's over 2,000 years old, it could be considered an ancient religion. Bible Christianity is the only ancient religion uh, whose founder is still alive. That's the marvelous thing. The Buddha is said to have died, if he even existed, said to have died about 500 BC. Muhammad died 640 AD. Karl Marx and the founders of communism are still dead. Joseph Smith, the founder and the false prophet of the Mormon church is still dead. But the boast and the glory of New Testament Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the tomb of Jesus Christ is famous for what it does not contain. Think about it that way. And the record of the book of Acts um, is that the emphasis of the apostles very first preaching was on the resurrection. On the day of Pentecost, the first sermon of the church age, preached by Simon Peter, centered on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Acts 2, verses 23 and 24. Later, Peter and John uh, heal a lame man outside the entrance of the temple. And when the crowd of curiosity seekers began to gather, Peter told them, Ye killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Acts 3, verse 15. Peter said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Acts 4, verse 10. And then Peter and John preached to the Jewish priests. They said, they said the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts 5, verse 30. But the foundation of the first preaching was on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a lot at stake if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. According to the Apostle Paul, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, uh, then we have no lasting hope beyond this life. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If he didn't rise again, he says, our preaching is vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. It's pointless to preach it, it's pointless to believe it. If Christ didn't rise again, Paul says, ye are yet in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. You're still guilty. You're still unforgiven by God. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he was buried, he rose again from the dead, and can grant you eternal life by trusting in him by faith, you're still lost in your sins if he didn't do those things. Faith is only faith if it's placed in something that is so. That's why it's important for us to understand and be certain about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ rose from the dead in triumphant glory, after having been dead for three days and three nights, uh, we know that God must exist. And how else could it be explained? It wouldn't fit some sort of uh, evolutionary theory, um, some sort of resuscitation theory. It required the uh, power of supernatural force to bring it about. The scriptures tell us 
But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. And then he tells us with meekness and fear. First Peter 315. And uh, you all know that we're told to study, show ourselves approved unto God. Second Timothy 215. Jesus himself said, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. John 5, verse 39. And so with those instructions by the Lord Jesus, I'm going to bring to you an outline I call how to defend the resurrection. How to defend the resurrection. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, then we have answers to some of the great questions of life. Where did we come from? I mean, we as people, human beings, where did life come from? Well, obviously, if God exists, God made you. God made the world around you. God made the animal life, the plant life. You weren't simply an accident of random molecules assembling themselves together without any intelligent uh, direction or purpose. But God made you. Why are we here? If, we're, if God did make us, why are we here? What's our, what's our purpose? Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith had a great answer to this question back in 1646. They said the chief duty of man is to glorify God and to enjoy fellowship with him forever. That's very succinct and to the point. The chief duty of man is to glorify God and enjoy fellowship with him forever. Where am I going when I die? Well, that will depend upon your relationship to the creator. And, the, and your relationship to the creator can only be established through the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. A Christian believes that all the answers, all the blessings, all the joys in the life to come are only through a risen and a resurrected Savior. Uh, a, a Christian author named Andrew Murray said, a dead Christ, I must do everything for, but a living Christ does everything for me. And that's very well put as well. I want you to consider a few testimonies that we have to the resurrection. Point number one, there's the testimony of the Christian church itself, the existence of the Christian church itself. According to the most recent World Almanac that I could uh, obtain, 33.3% of the world's population is classified under some sort of Christian heading. That's over 2 billion people in the world. About 2.5 billion people in the world. Now, I know that includes a lot of oddballs and a lot of weirdos and people who have no idea what they believe, so for lack of a, another answer, they just say, I'm a Christian. That takes in, uh, to, uh, includes uh, cults, and it includes a lot of people who twist and pervert scripture. But be that as it may, one-third of the world's population wants to identify itself with Jesus Christ in some fashion. Now, that outnumbers the followers of Islam two to one. Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism are all much older than the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the number of people who want to be known as uh, and identify with Jesus Christ uh, is far more than those three religions combined. And uh, unless, hardly, the Lord Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. That's the interesting thing. Hardly long enough to have an impact on the world. Unless something so profound happened that fixed Jesus Christ in the minds of the world that could not be denied and gave authority to everything he had preached and, and legitimacy to everything he had taught up to that time. And it was his resurrection. If Jesus Christ had not risen back to life again, his death would be no different than the death of anybody else who dies for some religious cause or some political cause. That happens quite often. But coming back to life again doesn't happen very often. You say, well, people are resuscitated in a hospital. I don't mean that. I mean coming back under your own power in, more, in a more glorified state uh, to never die again. 
How many people have ever done that? One. <laughs> well, third, uh, um, secondly, we have the testimony of the Christian day. The Christian day. Except for a few oddballs like Seventh-day Adventists and Seventh-day Baptists, virtually everyone who says they're a Christian understands that Sunday is the recognized day that Christians observe the life of Jesus Christ and want to draw closer to God uh, in the name of Jesus Christ somehow. The Bible says, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, Acts 20, verse 7. He told the church at Corinth to take up their collections when they gathered on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. The day of Pentecost fell upon the first of a week, according to the, the instructions for that observance found in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 23, 16. God chose that day to begin his church in power, Acts chapter 2. It wasn't a pope centuries later deciding that Sunday would be the day that Christians are supposed to worship. Uh, if it were a pope, then the Adventists would be right, that we're simply following papacy in worshiping on Sunday. The pope was a Johnny-come-lately. He got to the game late, after we had already been worshiping on Sunday for several centuries by the time the popes came along. But it was the fact that something so profound and significant had attached itself to that first Sunday following Jesus' death, and it was his resurrection from the grave. And from that time on, the disciples focused their attention on gathering on the first day of the week, no longer on the Sabbath at the, at the end of each week. They began each week with Jesus Christ, not working six days, hoping for some rest at the seventh day. Thirdly, let me say this, there's the testimony of the Christian book uh, we have a Bible made up of uh, Old and New Testaments. You cannot understand the prophecies of the Old Testament unless you've got the New Testament to see its fulfillment and their future fulfillment. Uh, nor can you appreciate what's given to you in the New Testament unless you read the Old Testament. So you need to have one, uh, you need to have them both. One without the other uh, is an incomplete diet for the Christian. The, the New Testament mentions the resurrection of Jesus Christ 104 times in the 27 books of the New Testament. And uh, we, we read about uh, his resurrection by six different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the writings of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. In the cases of Matthew and Peter and John, they were all witnesses to the events of his death burial and his resurrection and his ministry leading up to that. And it's remarkable how none of the writers in the New Testament tried to uh, argue and defend the resurrection because at that time, everybody knew about it. It was common knowledge. It was something that didn't need to be argued and defended and uh, forcefully uh, forced upon people to believe. Everybody knew about it. Peter, or rather Paul, preached in our text today, verses 29 to 31. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. It was common knowledge among all of his disciples, and it was reluctant knowledge by the chief priests and the rabbis. They didn't want to admit to it, but they couldn't uh, argue against it because it was so well known. Say, so, well, why didn't they talk about, uh, try to prove and argue with the proof of the resurrection? Because everybody knew about it at the time. You don't have to keep beating a dead horse when everybody knows it's dead. Point number four, let me say this, we also have the testimony of, of Christian reply, the Christian reply to skeptics. We actually have some pretty sound answers to weak objections. Uh, and it's important for us to answer a number of theories people have tried to put forward to explain the resurrection, explain the empty tomb. And we understand that not everybody wants to trust Jesus Christ. Not everybody wants to be born again. 
Not everybody apparently wants their sins forgiven. Not everybody wants to go to heaven. You live in a day and time where people think hell is going to be one big party. And go there with all their friends. Or everyone's going to go to heaven no matter what they do or what they believe. So they don't need the Bible. They don't need God. They don't need church. They don't need your religion. They don't need any sort of control of their impulses and their weak flesh. Do whatever they want and the God of love will take everybody to heaven. You'd be amazed at how often I hear that kind of slop preached by ministers at funerals during my day job. In effect, they think they teach that everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's in a better place. Everybody's with the angels now. Let me tell you this. There's no scriptural support in the Bible that when a person dies, they become an angel later on. That's part of Mormon mythology, that Moroni was a man. He became an angel and, and gave... Uh, the golden plates to, you know, Nephi or whoever got the plates. You know. But first of all, there's the theory that maybe his disciples stole the body of Jesus and then claimed that he had risen later on. Uh, when the guards reported to the chief priest that the tomb was empty, the chief priest gave them money and tried to persuade them to say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Matthew 28, verse 12. But if they were asleep, the obvious question would be, how do you know what happened? And if they admitted that they were sleeping on the job, they were asking to be executed. So that never gained any traction. They took the money. They might have made that claim, but the theory never grew. It didn't go very far. Secondly, there's the theory that the chief priests and the scribes uh, took the body of Jesus to prevent someone from venerating it or uh, worshiping it or saying that Jesus, uh, uh, starting some great uh, rumor or miraculous story about Jesus later on. Once they started preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the chief priests would need to do would be to provide uh, the body of Jesus, uh, pr uh, produce the body of Jesus, rather, and uh, the preaching would have stopped. But they couldn't produce the body of Jesus because they hadn't taken it, and the preaching didn't stop because Jesus did rise. That's a marvelous thing. Uh, don't you know that without the rising again of Jesus, there would be no Christianity, it never would have grown and spread with the kind of message that it preaches. Love your enemies. Do good unto them that hate you and persecute you and pray for them which despitefully use you and so on. Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar. Who wants to pay their taxes? Nobody. If you follow me, then you'll have to give up everything. Americans don't want to give up anything. We are a spoiled generation of people. And countries that are more affluent and have more technology and have been, have been prosperous uh, and have enjoyed the blessings of modern life, modern society, are probably the most pagan and barbaric and corrupt uh, societies in the world because they think they don't need God. They have their big screen TV. They have their nice home. They have their nice cars, their nice clothes. They have their nice computers. They have their nice friends. They have the best cell phone. They have uh, money in the bank. They have a good paying job. They have all of these things. They don't think God had anything to do with it. So why do I need God? That's the generation you and I live in. You want to bear that in mind before you become like that. Americans don't want to give up, any, give up anything. If you follow me, your family may turn against you. Well, nobody wants to cause friction among their relatives. Who would want to pursue any of those ideas unless the power of the one who said that, who said those things, transcends any inconvenience that might come about being a follower of Jesus Christ. And it was his resurrection. There's the theory that maybe in the dark of the morning, the women had gone to the wrong tomb and were mistaken about which one was empty. That would be easily solved by going to the right tomb once the sun came up. So that didn't grow. 
There is what was called the swoon theory, that maybe Christ was comatose and he was just unconscious. People thought he was dead when they buried him, but somehow in the coolness and the dampness of the tomb, uh, he revived and came back uh, out again. And then the theory or the stories of his resurrection were, began to grow and spread. But it's hard to believe that if Christ had first been scourged until he was raw and bloody, then made to carry the cross as far as he could before they um, enlisted the help of another Simon the Cyrenian to carry it the rest of the way, and then nailed him to that cross, hanging him on that crucifixion tree for six hours, being tortured, and uh, then thrusting a spear into his side, that somehow he would be able to rally three days later. The swoon theory only began in the late 1700s. I mean, I don't know anyone that would propose it today. How Christ would somehow have the strength to move away a stone, which they say weighed about a thousand pounds to cover the entrance to that tomb after having been beaten and weak and without any food or uh, medic, uh, uh, medicine uh, for three days is hard to believe. In 1840, there was a German critic uh, named David Strauss. And Mr. Strauss, who did not believe in the resurrection, uh, never rejected this idea, and he said, it is impossible that one who had just come forth from the grave half dead who crept about weak and ill, who stood in need of medical treatment, of bandaging, strengthening, and tender care, and who at last succumbed to suffering, could ever have given the disciples the impression that he was the conqueror over death and the grave, that he was the prince of life. And yet that's exactly what Jesus Christ is to us. He's the conqueror over the grave. He's the prince of life. Now let me try to bring this to a close. There was a man named Simon Greenleaf, he was the royal professor of law at Harvard University in the mid-1800s, 1833 to 1848. Uh, and his works helped to set the standards for um, legal inquiry, to get at the truth. Uh, legal evidences and the principles used in courts of law even today. But when he applied his legal skills and his investigative talents, to the resurrection of Christ, he concluded that the resurrection was one of the best supported events in all of history. According to the laws of legal evidence, which are used in justice courts even today. There was a British writer named Frank Morrison. He was also a skeptic. And he set out to refute the evidence for the resurrection. But after considering the best evidences and the best material available, he ended up defending the resurrection, wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? A writer named Lou Wallace thought that he would write a book refuting the resurrection, but after a thorough investigation on his part, he later became a believer in Jesus Christ, and he wrote a book which became, was turned into a famous uh, movie called Ben-Hur. The idea that Jesus Christ would still be in the tomb and still is still dead today, uh, how would you explain Christianity? How would you explain the fact that everybody worships on one day of the week in recognition of his resurrection? How would you explain the book that tells the story and the testimony of his resurrection by credible witnesses? How would you explain the lives changed by faith in Jesus Christ? How would you explain the... Uh, the conclusions drawn by well-educated men trying, who thought to refute the resurrection end up believing it. How would you explain it unless it actually happened? I've been working on a, a research to write a book on Buddhism. And I'm going to bring this to a close, but the best experts say very little is known about the Buddha. They don't, they don't know exactly when he was born. They don't know exactly when he died. There's very little that's been, that, if any, that can be considered accurate about his life. Everything we supposedly know about the Buddha was invented and promoted largely by the Chinese. Once Buddhism 
uh, entered into China. And by the way, the gospel of Jesus Christ actually was entered into China and was being preached uh, 150 years before Buddhism ever went into China. And so you have a religion, you, there is a religion entirely based on mythology. And everything we, they say they know about the Buddha or talk about the Buddha or teach about the Buddha was simply created out of thin air by Buddhist monks over the centuries. And it wasn't until the stories of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth began to enter into, into China that the, the stories of the Buddha began to take shape as a copycat. You know, we Americans complain that Chinese are copycatting everything, you know, Gucci handbags and Coors, uh, uh, Michael Kors purses and shoes and so forth. They've been copycatting a lot of things for many, many centuries. And the worst copycat was the copying of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ and the saving power of Jesus Christ. They believe in salvation, but without any admission of sin. Well, let's bring this to a close. I'm grateful that Jesus Christ not only died for my sins, but he rose again, victorious over the grave, having paid for my sins. And by faith, I can be saved and born again and trust in him. And a great spiritual transaction takes place. It took place for me on November 5th, 1967. He can take place for anybody else who's willing to trust him.